What is the Schomburg Center? To me, it is home. The place where we come to see who we really are, not just somebody else's reflection of who we are. The Schomburg Center is a place of culture, it's a place of history, it's a place of knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is a repository of all of the things that has documented our sense of worth as a people. For me, that means that it is a place of immense power. The Schomburg Center is a public research library and a cultural institution. For the study of the Pan-African world, it is perhaps the best in the world. My Schomburg Center is Arturo Alfonso Schomburg. Arturo Schomburg said, Black history and culture and intellect exists at a time when most people didn't believe that. He collected those evidences, and that became the beginning of the collection. And it has expanded and has grown to where it is now a world-class institution. It holds over 10 million items. There's no parallel anywhere that brings to light what we as people of color have done, what we continue to do. Black culture is all culture. The universals that animate everyone's life happen here for all people. The Schomburg for me is one of the center pillars of Harlem. When I started the journey of finding out about Red Rooster and Harlem, the very first place I went to was the Schomburg. Researchers from around the world come and use what we have here. I could not have written just about any of the books that I've written without the Schomburg Center's archives, resources. The Schomburg Center is much more than a library. We encourage lifelong learning and exploration. The Junior Scholars Program is a Saturday program with students from fifth grade to senior year in high school to help them learn about black history and culture. Learning about my history is important because it teaches me who I am. The Schomburg Junior Scholars Program is going to do nothing but uplift them. So many talented and brilliant people have walked the corridors of this amazing institution over the years. From Octavia Butler to Toni Morrison and James Baldwin, Ella Fitzgerald, Alvin Ailey, and Harry Belafonte, who graced the stage in this room of the American Negro Theater. This place evokes great memories. It was a gift to us in our community to really try to find that space to reflect expressions of black experience. I just knew that the environment, what I saw these young African Americans doing, was a place I needed to be. What is my Schomburg Center? I'm standing here at the Cosmogram, which underneath holds the ashes of the poet Langston Hughes. On the evening when this cosmogram was dedicated, people began to empty out of the auditorium. A jazz trio struck up, and to my amazement, Amira Baraka went over and asked Maya Angelou for a dance. And they started to dance on top of the cosmogram, on top of the ashes of Langston Hughes, and I felt what a fitting way to kiss the memory of Langston. The Schomburg Center is a research institute and a library, but it's so much more than that. There's something going on every day. So many amazing people come here to talk about their creative craft, to share what inspires them. The Schomburg Center's collections help to tell stories even beyond our walls. The Schomburg Center is here in this exhibition at MoMA, One Way Ticket, Jacob Lawrence's Migration Series, we depend on the resources of the Schomburg to enable us to tell this story. Thinking about the implications of the past on the present is absolutely crucial for understanding the next steps, understanding what we have to do to go forward. We today have the responsibility of making sure that new artists and activists, new scholars and poets know that this place continues to be a resource and a source of inspiration the work that we must continue to do. The Schomburg Center is knowledge. The Schomburg Center, to me, is education. The Schomburg Center is home. It is family. It is foundational. The Schomburg Center is inspiration. The Schomburg is with me in everything that I do. Community, inside and out. The Schomburg Center is us. The Schomburg Center is you. And we invite each and every one of you to find your Schomburg Center.
Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. And this welcome extends to all of those of you who are here in person with us, and of course, those of you who are joining us virtually. My name is Joy Bivens, and I have the immense ple pleasure, pardon me, of serving as director of this historic institution, where every day we celebrate black history and black culture. Our collection of 11 million items attests to the fortitude and the flyness of people of African descent across the diaspora. We are a free public research library and we encourage you to utilize our resor resources to engage your curiosity about the histories, the cultures, and the stories of black people. Before I go further, I would like to acknowledge the presence of our the New York Public Library's president, Tony Marks, who's sitting in the back there. Thank you for being here tonight. In just a few moments, I will be bringing my colleague, Novella Ford, Associate Director of Public Programs and Exhibitions to the stage to introduce this evening's programs and the guests who will grace our stage. But before I do that, I simply want to share how delighted I am to see you and to be able to greet you this evening as we prepare to engage in this fascinating conversation about the intersection of fashion, sport, and activism with three luminaries, Crystal McCrary McGuire, Tammy Brooke, and Mitchell S. Jackson, as we discuss his book, Fly, the Big Book of Basketball Fashion. So you are in for a good time this evening. Now please join me in welcoming to the stage, to the podium, Novella to share more about tonight's program, um, but also what we have planned for you during this fall programming season. Thank you for being here and welcome to the Schomburg. Thank you, Joy. Good evening, good evening. It's hot outside, but it's cool in here, so let's have some enthusiasm for that. <laughs> Welcome to the opening of our fall 2023 season at the Schomburg Center. As Joy said, I'm Novella Ford. I'm the Associate Director of Public Programs and Exhibition, and I am joined in this work by Khalila Bates, our producer, Park Boulevard, our techs behind the scenes, our volunteers, our security, plenty of facility staff, as well as our staff here at the Schomburg Center, and a host of people who say yes and assist us in scheduling our program participants. I want to take this time to thank them at the beginning of the season, as we'll try to also do in the middle of the season, as we will try to do at the end of the season. So please give them a warm round of applause for all that they do. As you saw in the video, the Schomburg is dedicated to the collection, preservation, and interpretation of global black experiences. We are able to fulfill our mission thanks in part to the support of Schomburg Society, a membership group made up of supporters from around the world. There are many ways to support the work of the Schomburg. Of course, being here at our programs, let us know that we are doing something right and that you want to come and continue to find discoveries um, and explore the world uh, of black culture through our eyes and through our archives. But of course, financial support is also another way that you can support the Schomburg. So if you haven't thought about joining the Schomburg Society, I hope you, think, I hope you take a moment to think about it and also join us. Now, throughout the year, we will talk a lot about the fact that we are coming up on our centennial anniversary. Can you imagine 100 years the Schomburg Center has been here supporting the Harlem community as well as the global black community? So this season, we've dubbed the Schomburg Mixtape, taking a page out of this hip-hop 50th anniversary and mixtapes created to discover new music from your favorite artists or new artists showing off their skills, or if you remember, like I remember, someone who is dedicated to making you a mixtape by putting a tape recorder, a tape in like your boom box, I wasn't even, what, right, or a tape recorder in front of another tape recorder and pressing pause and waiting for the radio to play the song that you most wanted, and somebody doing that painstakingly across one side and then the B side, I mean, that had to be love at that particular point in time. So think about that as you see the programming that we do throughout the year. We are thinking about our favorites in scholarship, those who are expanding our understanding of historical figures, the archives and ideas influencing contemporary society. 
There are many dates that you should save. I hope that volunteers, anybody have one of those rack cards? Please wave it in the air. Volunteers, if you have it in your hand and you want one, please put your hand up in the air and our volunteers will also bring you one. But next week we are celebrating the work of Ntosaki Shange um, around a book of unpublished works that were found in the archives. It's gonna be a beautiful evening of readings as well as conversation. An incredible book by Dr. Bettina L. Love, who is an incredible scholar uh, called, um, oh man, uh, the name of the book just fell out of my head, but hopefully you saw the slides that were showing earlier. We are talking about uh, Bayard Rustin and the incredible work that he did to help organize the March on Washington, as well as many other facts that you may not have known about this brother who was so integral and who had the great support of A. Philip Randolph um, in helping to bring that march to fruition, which this year celebrated the 60th anniversary. Of course, we go into October and we're celebrating the life of Willie Mae Thornton, also known as Big Mama Thornton, uh, and plenty more programs. So you can find out more about our programs by visiting our website at schomburg.org as well as registering for our programs via Eventbrite. Please take this time to silence your cell phones. Also, we love photos, but please, no flash photography. Tonight's Between the Lines program is the first in a series of programs we are organizing where basketball and other sports intersect with politics, activism, technology, and other areas of concern in our society. Mitchell S. Jackson is a Pulitzer Prize winning writer who is a contributing writer for the New York Times Magazine and a columnist for Esquire. His outfits of the day on Instagram and other social media never disappoint, and it makes sense that he would bring his fashion sense and his writing talents to bear on his latest book, Fly, the big book of basketball fashion. Today's NBA style has birthed the tunnel walk, has birthed the tunnel walk, think LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, and Russell Westbrook, where athletes are idealized as style icons. Their style and talents on the court have inspired conversations about their activities and activism off the court. Jackson's debut novel, The Residue Years, won the Whiting Award and the Ernest J. Gaines Award for Literary Excellence. His essay collection, Survival Math, was named a best book of 2019 by 15 publications. His writing has been featured on the cover of the New York Times Magazine, New York Times Book Review, Time, Esquire, as well as the New Yorker, Harper's Magazine, the Paris Review, and many others. He also holds the John O. Whiteman Dean's Distinguished Professorship in Department of English at Arizona State University. I don't know how he writes so prolifically while also teaching, while also looking as fly as he does, but you will get to see that in a moment. He will be joined in conversation by Tammy Brooke, who is the CEO and founder of FYI Brand Group, an unprecedented innovator specializing in pop culture 360 brand strategy, narrative content, and communications. Brooke and her award-winning agency of 23 years launched over 100 celebrity and brand collaboration campaigns from Dolce & Gabbana to Amir Stoudemire. Moderating the conversation is Crystal McCreary McGuire, an award-winning filmmaker, television producer, and author. She began her career practicing entertainment law before leaving to pursue a full-time career in writing, producing, and directing. Since that time, she has published two New York Times bestselling novels, Home Court Advantage, and Gotham Diaries, and written the critically acclaimed nonfiction book, Inspiration, Profiles of Black Women Changing the World. Crystal has also created, produced, and directed the Nickelodeon sports series, Little Ballers, and Little Ballers, Indiana. Crystal's eldest son, Cole, is a point guard for the NBA team, the Orlando Magic. Cole was recently, maybe some of you all have been following, uh, recently called his mom a super mom. They are currently launching an app to help others who are developing, who are finding ways to develop themselves as they try to enter this place called the NBA. She is an example of someone whose brilliance and service to others is equally matched by her style. We will have time for audience questions and a book signing following the conversation. Please use the mics when it's time to uh, ask your questions. Also, books are available in our Schomburg shop and it will be open now as well as after the program. First, we'll have a presentation by Mitchell S. Jackson and then he will be joined by Crystal McCrary McGuire for conversation along with Tammy Brooke. Please welcome Mitchell Jackson. Oh, I think I need to move the mic. Oh, am I good? Oh, I was fine. I got, I got a 
Michael Malapel, I'm good. How's everyone doing? Thank you for being here. Uh, I have to give out uh, thanks to uh, Leah, uh, the publisher of Artisan and Workman Press, uh, to Shoshana, I, I don't know if she, she gotta be here. She, she edited this book, she was on me. Uh, yes, to Shoshana, uh, to my guy Ryan, uh, to Ilana and Cindy, who I've been pestering with a lot of emails all day long, all week long. Um, obviously, thank you to the Schomburg for, for hosting us. I can't think of a better place to host this uh, book event than the Center for uh, Black Research, right? Um, and thank you all for showing up tonight. I know it's Fashion Week, and y'all got some invites that y'all was like, nah, I think I'm going to go do some literary stuff tonight. And uh, I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to keep it 100 with you. Uh, this book was not my idea. People have been asking me, like, where'd you get the idea from? Why? Well, it wasn't my idea. But I know a good idea when I hear one. And uh, 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 Leah and Ryan brought this idea to me, saying, what do you think about a book on NBA fashion? I'm a, a failed dream basketball player and a lifelong uh, wannabe fashion guy. And uh, you know, it seemed like a perfect uh, kind of mixing of my intersection of my taste and um, you know when I think about where we are in the culture I think we are probably witnessing uh, the most stylish era of pro sports uh, in general and I think that the NBA is a forerunner in professional sports um, and so that to me made sense that these were things that were marrying passions of mine and then also that we were witnessing a phenomenon oh excuse me in our culture uh, at the heart of this book is the question of how that era came to be. How are we witnessing this era of most fashionable NBA players and the most fashionable era of sports? And then how did we get this NBA phenomenon, these young men who are now making exorbitant amounts, well, not exorbitant, great amounts of money uh, and, and, and known all over the world. And so uh, that really was driving this um, book. Um, I think I'm a pro stylist. If you ask me, that's, I'm, I'm, I'm not a writer, I'm not a historian, I'm not a journalist. I really want to be a pro stylist, which means I take a lot of pride and uh, a lot of joy in writing sentences. So I am going to read a little bit. I know y'all really didn't come here to read me read, but I know it's a coffee book, but then it also has words in it. And uh, I wanted y'all to hear that there were actually some words to go along with the pictures. Uh, and I will also show you some of my favorite pictures before uh, Crystal and Tammy and I have a conversation. So I'm just going to read just the opening. Uh, I'll give you a little background on this. Um, I just wanted to write an opening about basketball because I love basketball. And um, I had the fight to keep this opening about basketball because it wasn't necessarily about fashion. But watch how I turn it. <laughs> George, Mr. Ba basketball Mike, barreling across the lane and banking his signature two, hook for two. Bill's Secretary of Defense, Russell, leaping almost to the garden's rafters to knock a high arching shot damn near into the nosebleeds. Julius Dr. J. Irving defying physics as he swoops behind the backboard, his planetary fro close to kissing the foam and reverses a one-hand layup over outstretched Lakers. George the Iceman, Gervin, all but floating the length of the court and over a packed key, finger rolling a ball that falls from heaven straight through the net. Swish. Larry Legend shooting a silky baseline floater in the game. He played with his offhand just because he could. Irvin Magic Johnson fast breaking in the form with his signature dribble and ledger demanding defenders with a wide eyed look away that finds a divining Michael Cooper for the score. Michael Air Jordan soaring from the free throw line in that mythic dunk contest. The goat skywalking laughs a bath, right arm double clutching the ball above his head, left arm winged at his side. Allen, A I. Iverson, step back crossing Tyrone Lou off his feet, ankles, ankles, then stepping over his falling foe with the palm of a human who feels implacable. Stephen, Captain Canada, Nash, zigging and zagging and spinning and twirling through a whole team 
of confounded defenders before sinking a crunch time mid-range fadeaway. LeBron, King James, bounding from a whole other dimension to smack Andre Iguodala's crunch time could have been game ceiling layup almost through the glass. An astonishment that helps his Cavs win their very first championship. Stephen Chef Curry launching a 15th all-star three-pointer from a deep corner and turning a section of gobsmacked courtside fans, turning to a gob section of gobsmacked courtside fans while the ball arches to affirm what he knows. Splash. Demetrius Ja Morant turning the Nuggets into a facile skills challenge and soaring into a sublime 360 that ends with an immaculate offhand finger roll, the transcendent ones. We watch sports for exemplars of excellence, for the chance to see a human flout physics best odds prove metal for the sagas born of the perennial pursuit of victory. We remember feats like the one above for how they testify to physical gifts and bear on the outcomes of games but also for their flair in which they were achieved. In other words, the greats or soon to be greats enthrall us not only by what they do, but how they do it, by their style. <clears throat> I just want y'all to know I put some words in here with the picture. That's all. <laughs> you know, it's a couple more of them, too. Uh, I want to show y'all some of my favorite photos. Uh, I hope they're queued up. Uh, yeah, look at that right there. AI. Y'all remember that when he crossed over Ty Lue? That's, he says that's actually not one of his least favorite memories in the league because he made his friend look really bad. But it's too bad, man. It's, it's iconic. But uh, here, um, I think this is super hip hop. I don't know if y'all remember them bracelets, but all the rappers had this same bracelet in the videos in the mid uh, 90s to the late 90s. And Pele Pele, come on, I mean, that's straight hip hop. And it's velour too, like remember them Sean John sweatsuits? Yeah, we, we can go to the next one. Yes, yes, so uh, D'Angelo Russell is, uh, man, I think he's one of the most stylish guys in the league. Well, the league thinks he's one of the most stylish guys in the league. But I, I really like how he doesn't seem to dress like anyone else. Like, I feel like he could be going like a swaggy professor right here, right? Not, <laughs> not going to a, to a game, but like, he, he about to come teach with me. Um, but I mean, notice the shoes, you know, the spectators. He got a little, uh, the, the print on the jacket, you know, the different textures. I mean, what does he have a briefcase for? Like, he's going to a game, <laughs> right? This swaggy professor right there. Uh, we can go to the next one. I mean, iconic. Look at that afro. I mean, he even got the, the, the little stray ends on the afro. Like, he let you know it's real. He wasn't too manicured with his. And if you look, he got the rings on. He got a ring on his forefinger and a ring on his pinky. And it's matching his Casio white. Don't get no more 80s than that right there. I mean, this right here, like, and look at the glasses. I mean, this could be actually right now. You know, Dr. J was swaggy, swaggy. Uh, next. Yeah. I mean, did y'all watch the game? Did you see, did you, but did you see when he came in before the game? I saw this suit, I said, oh, he breaking a record tonight. Ain't no way he can wear this and not break a record tonight. Uh, but, the, but also the thing I think is really special is he needed 36 points to break that. That's, like, that's not just an average game. Like, that's a great game you need to break the record. And to wear this outfit and to need 36 points says a lot about him. And I just want to point out one detail. Uh, that, that lapel pin says, stay present. So I really think it's important like you, to keep yourself grounded in these moments. And that's how LeBron did it with a stay present lapel pin on this. And uh, if, you, if you saw the full length of this, you would see his end scene was hitting real nice, too. Like, he got a good tailor. Uh, maybe I think we got one more. Is that right? We got one more? Or maybe that's it. Oh, this might have been my favorite photo in the whole book. When I was young, we had Pistol Pete tapes. And you, you, know, you could watch them and learn how to dribble. I mean, I couldn't dribble like Pistol Pete. But I watched the tapes. And uh, he was flashy 
flamboyant. I don't know if y'all remember White Chocolate, Jason Williams, who used to play. Uh, but he was like a, a precursor to, to Jason Williams and really to Kyrie Irving uh, with that ball wizardry. And when I saw this photo, which was one of the very last photos that we chose for the book, I immediately said, oh, this is exactly how I think he should look. Like he is a representation here of the way that he played. And I think that's really important where the fashion is a representation of your identity. And so for me, to, and I'm like, this is a white dude with the chain and his name on it? Like, y'all thought only the brothers did that, didn't you? Now we know this has been happening for a long time and white dudes do it too. Uh, I think that might be the last photo, but I'm not sure. Oh no, okay, last one. Yeah. Um, I think this is an ultra, ultra important photo because LeBron is not only kneeling, he got his fist up. He's doing both the things that they told you you cannot do. Both the things that got Colin Kaepernick kicked out of the league, right? So like to me, this is an ultimate expression of power. He's in mid-court, in the bubble, on a knee with his fist up. For me, that's an exercise of power. Also, obviously, the Black Lives Matter. You cannot divorce that from what was happening in 2020, which is why we got to the bubble. Like, that's a really, really important and iconic moment that really shows us how, I mean, LeBron, stay present, and then LeBron over here with the Neil and the Black Power, really letting you know, like, I'm that dude. Um, that is all I have for these pictures. I want to bring out my illustrious panel, uh, Tammy and Crystal, back there shining on them. Y'all ain't seen it yet. Yeah, yeah. Wow, thank you. <laughs> that was incredible. Congratulations. Thank you, on, thank you. On, on Fly. I'm Crystal McCrary McGuire and uh, Tammy Brooke. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Um, And congratulations to you. You have uh, gotten a lot of uh, great press. We've been on a run together, <laughs> ain't we? <laughs> uh, so, so first of all, so happy to be here. Um, Tammy and I uh, have worked together for a number of years, and we have a documentary that we're working on right now about the history of um, fashion in the NBA. Um, and that's how um, uh, Mitchell and I, our paths first crossed, yep. working on, on that together. But, um, you know, basketball fashion has swept the world, and um, it's firmly a part of the American zeitgeist and the global sports ethos. So, um, historically, um, fashion is something that we, as black people in this country, um, you know, when you think about years of slavery, that was something that we could control, yeah. you know, on Sundays, when yeah. we went to church, when we were allowed to go to church yeah. and, and, and dress. And that was one of the things um, that Walt Clyde Frazier, who's featured in your books, yeah. spoke about um, in, in the documentary Little Ballers, is like that was the time to really um, express myself uh, off the court with, yeah. with my um, flam. Anybody who's seen Clyde Frazier, New York Knicks, <laughs> have you all seen his gear? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, when I think about respectability politics mm -hmm. in our community, in how we have dressed, in the overlap of that restraint mm -hmm. with what you refer to as the flamboyance period of yeah. fashion in the NBA, which um, when you all pick up the book, which I hope you do uh, afterwards in the, in the shop, but the flamboyance period of fashion in the NBA, 1964 to 1980, as you define it, yeah. um, in the book, um, you say that this is when NBA fashion was born. Yeah. Speak about that. Yeah. I mean, I think to, to, to well, first of all, that's a really great question. It's actually one of the questions that's crucial to making this book because I wanted to define it by eras. And so I think before we get to the 1970s, we have to know what came before it. And so if you're thinking about the inception of the league and it's coming pre-civil rights, Right, and so then when they are allowing black people to be a part of this league, which is first obviously a few people, they are under the restraints of 
pre-civil rights America, right? Which is puts a lot of pressure on you to have to be seen as respectable. Right. So I think that those early players had that. And then once we get past, you know, 68 and the Voting Rights Act, and you know, we start to Civil kind of loosen Act. up. Civil right. Rights Act, voting rights. We start to feel more empowered. Um, well, not we didn't feel more empowered. We actually have legal rights, right? <laughs> right? right. They're being uh, taken away now, yeah. but that's another discussion. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, so I think the 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 fashion becomes an expression of that power and that need to assert our individuality. I think you know if you were talking about people who were enslaved, like to get dressed up in your Sunday best was also an act of defiance, right? Mm. right? Because they were keeping us from wearing that stuff during the week. And I think the same thing. It's really an act of defiance when you get to 1970 and we're like, no, nah, we're we free. We're not right. sipping from the wrong, the other water fountain anymore and we're gonna wear what we wanna wear. Right. And so that really was a part of that era of, of, of the NBA. And then um, when you move further, which, which I thought was really interesting, you got into um, the Jordan era. Yeah. And you, you have said that you can't divorce the Jordan era from Reaganomics. Oh, man, <laughs> you know, that, now we're getting into the era that I lived through. I mean, 1980s, I mean, I remember watching Miami Vice and thinking <laughs> everybody on the East Coast was rich and drove a Ferrari. I had a police driving a Ferrari in Miami <laughs> Vice. Y'all you know, remember that? Like, th that didn't make no sense, right? Uh, but then, you know, if you think about Miami Vice was really, you know, the cocaine era of Miami, so there was, a lot of money happening. And then if you look on the West Coast, what's happening with, you know, Freeway Rick Ross and the way that that drugs was coming in and gangs are proliferating, like, there was a lot of wealth. There was also a lot of, obviously, other uh, problems. But I think that kind of flamboyance and that, like, we have money. And, you know, the nouveau riche are always trying to show you their wealth, their newfound wealth. And so I think that really influenced. And, and, and Jordan came through with the benefit of Magic Johnson and Larry Bird saving the league. That le the league was going bad, right? right. Before the merger, right. and before Bird and Magic, like they were, they would have never become what right. they did. Right. And so I think Jordan really represented that. You know, and the further he got along, I guess, you know, his infamous Republicans wear sneakers too, right. uh, uh, you know, kind of showed you about his, um, his I don't want to say his ethics, his values in, at the time. At the time. <laughs> at the time, yeah. Right, right. And, you know, that era of, of the NBA being saved and, and fashion sort of, you know, following along in the trends there of how, how the players were dressing, yeah. you can't talk about NBA fashion without talking about, you know, that era of David Stern yeah. and the NBA dress code that came about in 2005, yeah. which sort of overlapped with another era of the book, the Iverson era that intersected with hip hop, which I know Tammy, yeah. so Tammy, you can share this about yourself a bit, but Tammy um, has really been the architect of many of the, you know, looks and behind the scenes uh, that, uh, uh, you know, experiences and, and explosions onto the, the fashion world of, NBA players and NFL players sort of orchestrating that. But starting with that hip hop era that, that you know, is also defined as the Iverson era in your book, how would you um, d describe that era of NBA fashion as it led into the 2005 um, dress code that was implemented by David Stern? Well, there's, well, for one, NBA players want to be rappers. <laughs> rappers want to be NBA players. <laughs> so there's a big love affair between the two of these, these genres. So um, it was an interesting time. I remember Allen Iverson actually worked with the brand Avrex back then. And yeah. It was just Method Man, Allen Iverson, Latrell Sprewell, whoever could get one. And, um, you know, I think that it was the first time where they could display together this intersection, and it was, it was beautiful. Like, and it was the time of Hardwood Classics and Cooperstown and Air Force Ones, and it, everyone wanted to kind of dress the same. Mm -hmm. and, and there was a world where everyone was engaging together in New York. The Nick, it was just a really exciting time um, in culture. Um, and so I think that with, with the, the Iverson area, it, it all happening at the rise of hip hop, mm -hmm. now we're at Hip Hop 50, yeah. it, it, was just a, it was just like a perfect, perfect time for it all to come to life together. Um, 
and it keeps growing and growing now. So yeah. you still and see it a little And it had its wing. backlash. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure, for right. sure. Which yeah. gave rise to it. I mean, you talk about with the, the rise of the dress code, so it's, you know, Allen Iverson with, you know, he's, he's expressing himself through his fashion. He's expressing his culture. He's wearing his hair with the cornrows. He's yeah. wearing the jewelry. Yeah. It intersects with the malice at the palace, where is yeah. that right. huge fight uh, at, with, with the Detroit Pistons got into the fight, I think it was yeah. with the Indiana Pacers, yep. and then it was the Olympics where the USA players in yeah, 2004 yeah, right. yep. had on all sorts of, you know, what was characterized, I guess, as urban gear, yeah. that gave rise to this 2005 dress code. Right, How did absolutely. that impact NBA fashion? Yeah. Well, you know, something I was thinking about when, when Tammy was talking was you said everybody wanted to look the same, and I forgot about that, right? Like, Rock Aware, Sean John, Fat Farm, they all made the Fubu. same. FUBU. FUBU. Okay, <laughs> before them, yes. FUBU and, you know, Carl Kanai. Carl Kanai. <laughs> but but, but though, they made the same thing, and every like everybody wanted a Sean John sweatsuit. Absolutely. Everybody wanted a yeah. Fat Farm sweatsuit. So right. we were not individualized, but I think one thing that the dress code did is it, it, it made people have a uniform, but it was not of their choice. Right. Right. And a lot and of people, so, players, um, resisted it. Yeah, they, until them fines got too big, <laughs> then they... <laughs> kowtow a little bit uh, but 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 also I think it, it created that uniform and so I think where we got to after that was a reflex against being pushed into looking the same and so now we have guys really really trying to be individuals on the court you know so I, I think it's a I mean maybe we get back to a uniform again but I think because it was imposed by people who had power over them that there was a lot of resistance to it and we, and we get now people who are, are really, really trying to signal how individual they are. Right. I mean, and some embrace it. I mean, Kobe Bryant, you talked yeah. about in your NPR interview how yes. Kobe Bryant really embraced the culture. I mean, speak a little bit how yeah. he embraced it, and then that influenced a whole yeah. um, legion of players coming up behind him. Well, Kobe was always the guy who was counter to his era. And so because they were all doing all this hip-hop, he had to go the other direction because he was the one who separated himself from everyone else that was in his era. So it made sense that Kobe would refine his look to a Tom Ford, really slim silhouette while everyone else was doing ultra baggy suits and wearing headbands. And I think I forgot to mention about that iconic Iverson photo. He had a lollipop, you know, like, <laughs> like that's in the, the king of like carefree. And I, I'm at a game, I'm on a lollipop, you know, so I think that is the anti-Kobe. Right. Like one would never, you cannot find a photo of Kobe sucking a lollipop at a game. Uh -huh. <laughs> you can't find it. Because it doesn't even say, like that's just not his public or maybe probably private, I don't know what to do, but private persona, you know? So, so I think that really speaks to Kobe uh, wanting to delineate himself from everyone else in this era, which is why all them guys say Kobe is the best. Mm. Mm. What do you I mean, think? That's Tim? not only he's why. a step above. Yeah. I mean, he was on the A level trajectory day day one. I mean, yeah. the GQ model just had the the track the trajectory to get into the GQ world. Kobe was the, the one to do it, and his tailored suits and the way the GQ started embracing NBA culture was from Jordan, from him. It really started with them, and then it went to LeBron and Melo and and uh, Amari and so many other players as it kind of went from 25, 2005 to 2010 and it just opened wide up. Um, and I think that so many of the players wanted to be in GQ. Yeah, so then wow. they also dressed up and dressed the part as well. I think about decision night uh, for LeBron, mm -hmm. he was wearing a plaid, he was wearing like a, yeah. a plaad shirt, you know, and, it's a, and then, then as soon as the big three started, it was, Okay, let's let loose a little bit, you know. So it and talk about the big three and that impact and who you're referring to in the big three because I think yeah. you talk about it as yeah, well in the it's, book. It's yeah. crazy. So big three is the Bosch, LeBron, Wade era, and I worked with Bosch at the time, and it was really just such a family environment that that Miami era of the big three, um, and they really were a pack, like the three of them. It's like how we're going to dress, how we're going to come in, how we're going to own the whole narrative around culture in the NBA and you know historically I don't think we will ever see anything like the big three again yeah. and it, it was also added, known as what what do they call them the, the heatles the heatles so yeah. I mean there was times where I mean we would just have like Bosch's birthday and we had like 
Wade, Bosch, LeBron all playing different instruments and said it was intentional. We're going to call the Beatles mm. the, he the Heatles the Beatles and we're going to do photo ops and it, was, it went viral and that was like an interesting time because it was right before Instagram yeah. went viral but it was TMZ and everyone was still covering it and yeah. they, own they, owned they owned the NBA intersection of culture in a way that opened up the tunnel, I think. It was really just around that time, 10, 2010, we moving into the finals and post-game press conferences and how that all yeah. manifested. You know, every aspect of your book is you break it down into the, 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 the eras, the conformists, flamboyance, Jordan, Iverson, dress code, and then the insta-tunnel walk from 2016 and beyond. Yeah. Uh, take us to, you know, I want both of you all to really talk about this because um, you both come, come at it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. I mean, your book is infused with um, the historical moments yeah. that you integrate into what was going on in the NBA mm -hmm. and what was going on in the larger, in the larger society. Yeah. As, we, as we, you know, you, you tell the Instagram story, mm -hmm. uh, the creation of that, yeah. and, and could, you, could you share that with us and how that impacted the explosion of the tunnel to runway era in the NBA? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think we need very popular players for it to happen, right? And then you need a mechanism for them to measure. I think the great thing about Instagram is you can measure immediate impact in a way, you know, like, oh, yeah. you think about like when you're a music artist, you, you like radio because you can measure how many spins you have, right? Like you can measure how many records you sold and Instagram gives you an instant metric. And you can also change it, right? Like you don't gotta do focus groups anymore. You could just post a picture and say, oh, that didn't work. Right. And then this works. And you can even take that picture down and do it up. So I think that the, that the people that were using it and early adopters really figured out that, oh, this is a way that I can express myself and I can get immediate feedback for right. this. Um, and, and, and we didn't have that, right? And I think also, you know, if we think culturally, people were already used to oversharing, right? We already had social media. We had, right. you know, go back to Black Planet for us, you know? Or, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, I was on Black Planet, oh. My space. You probably still got your handle somewhere. <laughs> um, yeah, My Space, Black Planet, you know, all the way up to Facebook, right? And so we had been already accustomed to, um, to, to sharing, to, to creating images, right? Uh, and then to just watching other people's lives in that way. And so Instagram just came in the right moment right. with a league that had superstars, right? Like LeBron is the biggest superstar since Jordan, right? So they needed a LeBron to, to, to catalyze that moment, right? I don't know if we could have got it with Chris Bosh, no disrespect to Chris Bosh, sure. but like we needed LeBron to get to the tunnel. Right, right, no, yeah. for sure. And Tammy, and you were there at the beginning of the tunnel, I mean, orchestrating from behind the scenes, um, I guess that, that formula yeah. for the NBA player that reached icon status um, in the fashion space. Yeah, I mean, for me, I think when I really noticed that there was an intentional moment that we could strategize and really build these moments with players where they can they can have a career outside of being, it really comes to the business of it. Mm -hmm. So working with my clients and realizing you have a career off the court and you now have a captive audience who's watching everything you do. And we saw it, I say, the 2011-2012 the NBA Finals OKC against the Miami Heat and all the post-game press conferences, and they're in the book, yeah. went viral from the waist up of Wade and Russell Westbrook with their glasses, and then New York Times was doing stories during uh, the style section. Look at their glasses, and look at Russell's printed shirts. And so then there was a moment going into, the, I think it was really, for me, it was crystal clear that you could, then going into the next NBA season, we can really just capitalize on the gravitas of these players and the captive audience and go right into the tunnel. and. Um, I, at the time, was, had started working with Russell Westbrook, so went right into them making it to the finals, all eyes on him, going to New York Fashion Week that September, going to the shows, meeting Anna Wintour, going but to the U.S. that's a formula to even oh, get formula. invited to the show, yeah, right? You gotta, I mean, how, like, yeah, you don't just show up and it doesn't just happen <laughs> and Tom Brown's dressing you. It's a whole process. <laughs> so, and then Russell had the captive audience. Instagram just was now there. Yeah. And it's interesting because, you know, I think he might have had like a million followers back then now. Mm. It's got like 
30 million. And it's just, mm -hmm. it, was, it was the right time, being the right players. And so many of these players were doing it at the time. Wade was doing it, Amari had taken over the Knicks. He came to the, ca the fashion mecca of the world, New York City, and played yeah. for the Knicks. And he, he owned it. And Chris and I worked with him at the time. We did little ballers with him. And he was such a fashion innovator. Right. And he took, he was also, he went right into it and brought in, that same season, brought Anna Wintour uh, to a game mm. and sat next to her at the Tommy Hilfiger show. It went viral. Yep. And uh, he opened up a lot of lanes for so many players to see what was happening and jump right into this model. And, I was there at the time doing it with, with Russell and other players as well, so it's exciting. And then the crown jewel in the, the, the fashion world is for one to be invited as a player to the Met Ball. Right. Uh, then that becomes like a whole other yeah. level of competition and aspiration to distinguish oneself in, in the fashion zeitgeist. I mean, that, yeah. but that just doesn't happen because you say, I want to go to the Met Ball. No, it takes <laughs> years to get invited to the Met. Um, and it's a process. I always say you should start your Met campaign a year in advance. Okay. Uh, it's not a joke. There you go. <laughs> Starting now. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's, it's the holy grail. There's nothing higher. If you've gotten to the Met, you've arrived. Just make sure you don't ever not you get disinvited. So you got to keep going. <laughs> that, that must a be lot worse of, than being yeah. invited. Yes, yeah, to not be there. And people yeah. like, why aren't you there this next year? I mean, happen. unless you're Beyonce. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or Drake. Yes, Drake. They don't give him his plus one. He ain't going. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah, so you know, getting the Met invite, and, and that all happened in 2010. You know, there was a people behind the scenes at Vogue who really believed in sports, good, good ah. friends of mine. Mm -hmm. um, right. That, uh, you know, were what, what did they see the value of sports? Were they looking at it from a marketing perspective, an eyeballs perspective? It's I mean, all what changed? of it. It's all of it. It's their icon, Serena Williams, mm -hmm. you know, LeBron James. If you look at the Vogue covers starting in 2010, they yeah. all became, Anna, they opened up to really celebrating athletes. Beyond models also, Absolutely. I mean, that's part of that era. Absolutely, the Olympic issue back, I think it was, uh, yeah. yeah, those were iconic issues. And at the time, that, that there was an in intention around Vogue deciding to celebrate and, and embrace this community of athletes. That's right, they had the LeBron yeah. cover with Giselle. Yep. I used ah, to use yeah. that picture in my classroom. Yeah. Um, What'd you teach about the LeBron and the well, Giselle picture? Well, I don't know if y'all want to get into that. Yeah, I want to know. <laughs> if, if uh, what, what class image, was this? <laughs> they had LeBron looking real hoking on the side of Giselle, damsel in distress. I mean, oh. I, I don't. Oh, you know I mean, that's another bold. Cause <laughs> y'all say that one for the uh, yeah. the next book. Yeah. <laughs> column, column. 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 Okay. Next I, column. I want I want to um, hear that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, it, it's interesting <clears throat> with what um, doors have been opened for athletes, particularly in the NBA, as it relates to fashion and yeah. them being able to express themselves off the court and get eyeballs and marketing opportunities on them based on their sense of style, yeah. right? Because while it's true on one level that um, they do kind of need to be stars to get the big campaigns, yeah. but what the fashion forward NBA players have been able to do, um, that could be a 12th man yeah. on a team, yeah. what they've been able to do by having like this real sense of fashion, they've been able to create a lane for themselves where they get like Josh Christopher, yeah. right? <laughs> so Josh Christopher, known as, I mean, that has, you, you've worked with him. I just I mean, took him to Paris. Yeah, right, you took, so like, yeah. He's not necessarily a household name, a, yeah. a great basketball player, but he plays for the Houston Rockets. I don't think he's a starter, yeah. but having um, this ability to express himself through yeah. his style, yeah. I mean, describe how that has opened up other opportunities for, for, for him and other players. Yeah, it's, it's amazing, and I think they're all kind of looking at the blueprint. Yeah. At very young age, you, you're seeing high school players, and you can yeah. think about Cole. Like, you're, they already, I think Cole already had like half a million followers before he was, you know, drafted. Um, same with same with Josh and so many of these players like Jalen Green. They're so young, and they already have a captive audience before they're even drafted. So the pressure's on, but then also the blueprints there, and they're ahead of the game. And the access to social media, they can see what Rick Owens is dropping the day it comes out in Paris, and they can figure out how to navigate. So they're way further ahead in this decade, in this generation. Yeah. So by the time he had it, you know, the players have great sense of style, access to money because mm -hmm. they're playing in the league. 
Um, you know, he's a very good looking guy, fits in model in sample sizes, so it worked. And you know, and Josh, you know, great example. Yeah. Designers like Rick Owens and Givenchy embraced him because of the way that he dresses. He's you know, league fits also all these, we can get into that. Yeah. And NBA fashion yeah. fits. Yeah. These are now Instagram accounts that are dedicated to showing the tunnel looks every day yeah. for these players. So they have an opportunity to engage with the designers in season and be intentional. Yeah. So if I'm working with a player and they want to go to Paris, okay, you want to go to this show, wear a few tunnel looks, tag the designer, tag the creative director, get them to pay attention to you and know who you are. And if you also happen to have the DNA, great looking guy, know how to dress, you might get actually elevated into being a player in the fashion game. Yeah, yeah. Shout yeah. out to Chad. In here. <laughs> oh. yeah, fashion fits. <laughs> oh, DM him you, with your outfit tonight. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> um, that made me think also about contextualizing it because I feel like, you know, I'm going to go back to Jordan and, 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 and breaking the NBA or elevating the NBA to maybe its apex. Um, these players are now enjoying the TV money from the Jordan era, and obviously from what LeBron and them were able to do. And now, I mean, I was looking at the contracts over the summer, like this looked like Monopoly money for everybody, <laughs> right? And so now, even if you're a 12th man, you still have the luxury right. of having the kind of contract. I mean, I had a friend who got drafted as a lottery pick, and I think his first year salary was like 1.6 million, which to us was like, man, you a millionaire. But to them, it's like, I mean, I think you could be like low end of the first round and get 1.6 million. I don't even know. Maybe more than that. So, so the money that they have also gives them much more uh, opportunity and 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 the, and the ability to do whatever they really want to do in the in the fashion world. Whereas, you know, league minimum was like three hundred thousand dollars back in the day. You couldn't right. just do whatever you wanted to do. Right. You're not going to Paris and sitting front row Fashion Week and buying the latest Tom Brown. No. Off 300k. No. <laughs> no disrespect, like, I, give it to me, but we can't do it. <laughs> <clears throat> so now, you know, NBA players are considered the trendsetters mm -hmm. of style. Um, and they are, you know, being noticed on Main Street. They are, do, you have Kyle Kuzma yeah. doing the <laughs> Panera ad, sips and drips. You know, what am I gonna sip on in my drip? Yeah. And so when I interviewed you for um, our Tunnel to run Runway documentary, I thought it was really interesting, the point, you know, we, we, we discussed and yeah. that you brought up. You yeah. said, you know, it gets to a point where when players, um, NBA players are so mainstream yeah. and, you know, so commercialized, yeah. um, do they get to a point where they are no longer the trendsetters? Yeah. Uh, how, do you, how do you view that with like this, you know, um, massive, uh, you know, set of, of eyeballs on, on, on the players for being the ones who create the style, but if, yeah. if the street doesn't feel like it's real anymore, yeah. and that it's just a matter of, you know, we're just trying to get some marketing dollars, yeah. does, does that fall off? This, um, I think that this particular, I don't want to call it a problem, this particular question is easier than it seems because to be fashionable, you have to understand where it's going, right? So you always have to be at least one step ahead of where the regular people are. And to be mainstream, you are where everything is happening. So the people that are, they still gonna be fashionable, people who are gonna be ahead of mainstream, and then mainstream gotta catch up, and then they go again. I mean, that's why Michael was last week at Bruno's thing, because you gotta know what's next season, right? So like, but the rest of us are back here like, oh, we got to wait till this hit Bergdorf. <laughs> or the outlets. Yeah, so I, so I think that that's right. Yeah, no, for real. <laughs> On the, the outlets discount. for real, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Woodbury, Woodbury Commons. <laughs> Avail yourselves. Avail yourselves. <laughs> Man, they used to have a, a Y3 selling Soho. I was in there every year. Like, y'all got by 11 and a half in here? Um, yeah, so I think that it is, it's, it's, I mean, it's already maybe as corporatized as it could possibly be. Mm -hmm. Like when I saw, I think I was watching a Houston Rockets game and they had a step and repeat in the tunnel with corporate logos, not just Houston Rocket logos, right. but corporate logos. I was yeah. like, oh, okay, this is a I see what it is now. Yeah. Right. But again, you still can't be fly 
without knowing what's next. Absolutely. So, right. so, so, so somewhere in there, there's a, there, there's a middle ground. Like right. maybe the players who don't have that vision will kind of fall by the wayside because you, you can't just keep up. You actually have to lap people right. in order to right. stay there. And it comes, from the, it comes from the streets. I mean, I had a conversation with yeah. Russell, Will, um, Russell um, Westbrook yeah. <clears throat> a month or so ago, and he was talking about his line, um, oh, Honor yeah. the Gift. Yeah. And he was saying that he has really been influenced by, um, by, the, by the kids, yeah. by the streets, mm -hmm. by the, the community. And that yeah. really is, is, you know, who who they rely on yeah. to wear their gear, to inspire them, yeah. and to set the next trends. Absolutely, absolutely. You gotta stay tapped in, right? but you can only really be tapped in if they respect you. Like if they think you lame, you can't even be tapped in. <laughs> right. <You know? laughs> they right. not gonna talk to you. Or I mean, I might be lame, <laughs> I don't know. I'm just saying, I don't think the cool people is gonna talk to lame, so what you gonna do then? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll, I'll add to that. I think if you're if you have it in your DNA and you're that guy, you're that guy. Because uh, right. I rep Travis Scott. He can do a McDonald's campaign and still yeah. be that guy. Yeah. Because he's creative right. and innovating. And yeah. it's to your point. Kyle Kuzma did Panera, but he's at the Rick Owens show and he's the only NBA player invited, you yeah. know, so it, a, a week later. So it's all relative. If you stay ahead, sure. you continue to show that you're in front of the culture and that mm. you're a trendsetter and a trailblazer and a risk taker. I don't think that you did. Right. You have anything to worry about. And about authentic too commercial. as well. I mean, yeah. um, Jim Moore, um, one of the founding editors of GQ, who did all of the iconic GQ sports covers, one of the right. things he was talking about um, in our doc was how there are a slew of NBA players. Some of them, the clothes wear them. Yeah. <laughs> and others, oh, yeah. they wear the clothes. Yeah. Uh, and, and usually, as he described it, it's the ones who are, you know, authentic yeah. that are able to actually wear the clothes and take risks yeah. as well. So <clears throat> let, let's, let's, let's switch to um, who in this both, who is your all-time starting five NBA fashion? <laughs> you go first. Oh. <laughs> I, I need a minute. <laughs> okay. Um, uh... Can I do two for like a two, like a? Can we do two eras? I like do two eras. I just want to do order. two for one. Oh, oh okay. okay. Two for one. All, All right. right. So you got to put Walt Frazier in there. I was like, say you, that. you cannot. I mean, you right. can't yes. not yes. put him in there. Yes. Uh, but I'm going to pair him with Wilt because also it's really hard to be fashionable when you're that tall. <laughs> right. 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 So like Wilt right. was fly at seven feet. That's a feat. Right. It's um, not easy to do. Yeah. I mean, you got to have um, Iverson in there. I mean, defined an error. So certainly right. Iverson is in there. Uh, I'm going to say LeBron because for me, LeBron, one thing LeBron knows is how to dress like who he is in the world. Like he know, like he's been saying King James and doing this shit for <coughs> how many years now, right? And he dresses like that, like jewelry. You know, like how many of them Van Cleef bracelets he have on in that? picture with the suit, like 10 of them. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm, I'm here. I'm going to put Westbrook in there, but I will say that his, his style is not in my taste, but I can recognize what he does and know that he, is, he has pushed. Like, we don't get to this air without Westbrook. Uh, right. And then I'm going to say, oh, this is tough now. Now we're getting real. <laughs> this is tough. Ooh, I'm not going to say Jordan, y'all. I mean, I look, man, listen. <laughs> Y'all remember them suits? Them high-waisted jeans? Oh, mom jeans? Come on jeans? now. <laughs> I can't do it. I love Mike, but uh, come on, y'all. Uh, one more. Uh, <laughs> shit. I'm going to pick Shy. I'm going to pick Shy. I mean, Shay. Sorry, Shay. I'm going to pick Shay. Okay, yeah, I'm going to pick Shay. That's probably, I don't know, but I, I had to pick somebody right now, so Shay. <laughs> Well, for me, this is a tough one because there's so many different guys that represent different things. Mm -hmm. So there's like that preppy player that mastered it really well. Chris Paul? Yeah, I mean, oh, there's yeah, a, he's yeah. owning that. I mean, I, I think historically Walt Frazier, he's a legend. Um, personally working with Russell Westbrook, such an authentic... Two for two. Risk, risk. I was gonna say I was gonna do five that you didn't do. But okay, <laughs> all right. I can't not. I mean, if they fly, they 
Fla. He's, he changed the game. Okay. Um, I will definitely say Shay. Shay is, yeah. you know, having worked, I've worked with him for two seasons. This guy is on the pulse. Even his captions. The, he's a fly. rapper too now, but the <laughs> caption, the, the, the way that he's been able to identify emerging designers and take risks with them and get ahead of, of what the competitors were doing, because it's all a competition, right. who, who dresses better. Um, you know, he, he doesn't want to wear anything that anyone else is wearing, neither does mm -hmm. Russell. Russ, same, same mentality. So he's like, the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to find designers no one else is wearing. So yeah. um, I'm trying to love, tell you, you better and, put and, Dr. And J going on there. To, going, to <laughs> shoot, going to shoot with him, he styles himself. Russell's uh. the same thing. They don't need no help. Just put the, everything in the room, and I'll curate myself. Um, definitely Dennis Rodman. Rockstar, ah. rockstar. Ah. Okay, Dennis. He's my okay. favorite. Okay. okay, Live for him. Yeah, I mean, All talk right. a minute. I mean, about the, I the gender him. bending yeah. as well. Yes. He was just everything. Young Thug, everything that's Young true. Thug got yeah. was from him. Um, where am I at? Yeah, four. I think that's four. Shoot. <laughs> you see what's up there? They, right over I here. I feel like there's some pressure J behind me. Right here. Right here. Yeah. Irving. Yeah. Like this impeccable. Impeccable. Yeah. And he's monochromatic. Yeah. Everything. I'm just, yeah. he's the one. Yes, I absolutely. fly. And also, Dr. J evolved. Yeah. Because, like, you see some dudes, like, they fly in 72, they the same fly <laughs> the rest of their life. <laughs> right? Like, y'all know them people. Like, probably your uncle. Like, he was fly <laughs> in yeah, 91. Yeah. yeah. And he got the same hair. He got the same part from 91. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I like the fact that Dr. J had this, and now he got the short with the little part on the side, like evolution. Yeah. <laughs> Y'all ain't got that uncle. I got an uncle. He's stuck in '88. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not mad at that. Jared him. curl. He still has you a jet. You know, curl? he got the Jared curl. You know how hard it is to find some curl <laughs> juice in 2023. <laughs> <laughs> you got to buy that by bulk. <laughs> Oh, that's only oh. my uncle, though, huh? All right. <laughs> All right. Um, you know, you, you brought up LeBron earlier um, as, as your top five. I want to say, um, you know, shout out to LeBron also for what he did with, with fashion in the NBA that also intersects with his power yeah. mm -hmm. and his voice. Yeah. And it's the, the fashion for protest. Yeah. And um, LeBron had the, the, the will Mm -hmm. in the power, and he was among the first to wear the I Can't Breathe yep. t-shirts, and I know that you cover that mm -hmm. in, in the book. Uh, that's not easy to do, yeah. because we've seen in other leagues <laughs> where you get run out of that league yeah. if you protest just by taking a knee, mm -hmm. as with Colin Kaepernick. Yeah. Uh, speak a little bit about um, fashion for protest in the NBA. Well, I think it's, we cannot understate that LeBron is making these decisions with Obama in office. Right, right talk about that. Right, and right. so we have feeling the empowerment, right? Like, you're not gonna have your president criticize you for taking a stand on, in black protests right. as a black man, right? right? So do you have that? And then remember that Kaepernick takes his stand with, uh, Trump. with Trump, mm -hmm. and Trump immediately criticizes him, right? Turns him into a political platform. So I think that's really where, where we are. Like, LeBron had the advantage of being the biggest star in the league, right? And then having a black president to kind of embolden him and to support him, even if it was, you know, tacitly supporting him, or I don't know, maybe they had some phone calls or something, but I think that's really important. And then we see on the other side of it, what happens when power like criticizes you, and also Kaepernick. Although he was a super, he was a Super Bowl player. I mean, he wasn't the lead face, right. you know. So, so I think there's there's also that. I think you know when we talk about now the 12th man gets it, but when we when we talked when we started talking about the tunnel, we were talking about NBA stars, right? right. And so you had to be a star. You got to understand what your cachet is, right. what's your power in the league, how much content, what is the context of all of this before you can run out there, like. Mahmoud Abdul Rauf, right? Great player in Denver. They Chris don't give Jackson, a damn about Denver, Chris you know. Jackson, right. And and was a big star, but wasn't the face of the league. And so when he takes his stand, he's out the league, mm -hmm. right? So so I think there's a there, there's a context that you have to understand. It just in the same way, you got to understand if I wear this brand, they're gonna make this decision. Like politically, you really got to understand right. that. 
I think also there's the benefit of the NBA players knowing, though, that they have guaranteed money. Right. <laughs> like, right. That's right. not, <laughs> we can't. No. And it was also, I mean, um, that was also pre-social media. Yes. That was pre athletes being their own brand True. with 100 in, in the case of LeBron you know 100 million plus followers yes. on all of the social social media platforms yeah. and right the guaranteed contracts that you know generational wealth yeah. along with you know being um, you know super conscientious yes for um, sure. so so but but still uh, you know the the NBA is a different league than the NFL or the yeah. MLB in terms of the ownership, in terms of the, the player makeup. I mean, yeah. even, you know, you talk about in the book, globally, the most um, recognizable athletes. Yeah. Uh, and, and three of them in the top, what is it, 30 are in the NBA, LeBron yeah. James, Stephen Curry, and Kevin Durant, yeah, mm -hmm. right, yeah. and this is just global recognition. Before this is this is globally before Tom Brady. Yeah, that's that's crazy, right? Because most people say he's the goat, right? right, and that they're more popular than him. Yeah, that says a lot. So, um, okay, so where do you all think NBA fashion is heading? Well, I'll just I'll say this. I'll say they say this all the time. We are in an era right now where Tom Brady, George Clooney, and LeBron James are competing for the same real estate mm. in corporate America or in a, on a corporate global scale on, on anything. So there's no there's it's there are no boundaries anymore. So it's the the market is wide open for NBA players to just take over. Um, whether it's being on the cover of GQ, the face of a Coca-Cola campaign, or a Tom Ford campaign. Mm -hmm. It's all uh, anyone's game. So I think that um, this is just the beginning of the NBA, um, you know, when you're a superstar and you know how to dress and you're really good looking and you might actually fit sample size <laughs> <laughs> straight that off helps. the runway. <laughs> you're in a position to take take on the world mm. beyond what you do on the court. So um, I think I think we're just it's just the beginning. I mean, I think about just where we were five years ago and designers were scared to take risks. You know, I did a campaign with Barney's. Um, Tom, you're here, the former head of Barney's men's um, was the biggest risk. They, they, I, I mean, Barney's hadn't done anything with an NBA player. They couldn't they, they, they'd done. In Lady Gaga, Jay-Z for two weeks, and they took such a bet on Russell mm. for multiple seasons to put Why did they take that bet? It was the right time. I, I don't have the answer, you probably do. <laughs> um, it was the right time, um, social media was paying attention. Uh, he, he was uh, a point guard. He was getting incredible press coverage. Mm. The fashion community was embracing him. Anna Wintour was standing next to him. He was showing that he was not just a, a guy to put on clothes, the clothes where he, yeah. he was a guy that wanted to curate and design yeah. and collaborate. And uh, it, was, it was just the right time to do it. So that was just, that was just you know, seven, seven or eight years ago. And then you see major designers starting to invite these players to the show. Then they're starting to get in these campaigns, like Hugo Boss is doing campaigns, and Russell was in an Acne Studios campaign. They, no one, other NBA player would have ever, it was unfathomable. Yeah. So I think as we enter this next you know, decade, it's gonna be super exciting to see more high luxury designers embracing this community that is taking over, that is becoming arguably more relevant than TV and film. Mm. And music, you know, it's it's the same. You know, you see, you know, even when you watch the All Star games, it's like all who's at the who is courtside. Yeah. It's uh, it's right. you know, it it's is a fashion show on courtside. Yeah. yeah, it is a fashion show now. The front row of a courtside game is a front row of, of an NBA. Forget tunnel to runway. Yeah. <laughs> it's now the it's now the it's the <laughs> it's the front it's courtside is the new front row of an NBA uh, of a fashion show. It's crazy. Right. Sky's the limit. What do you think, Mitch? Where's it? Where's um, it heading? I think it's headed away from where it's headed now. Because I think in order to stay fresh, you have to go the other way. Like you can't keep going the direction that you're going. So I think it's, it has to look different. Um, and one thing I, I was thinking about, like when you talk about like George Clooney and, and, and actors, uh, you know, if, we, if, if an actor's busy, I mean, we might see them in two or three films in a year, but someone like George Clooney, we're probably only gonna see once a year, right? Mm -hmm. And he, he, he might be a suave guy. He might just take on a role where he's like, 
you know, an emaciated guy who's struggling on the street. But an NBA player, you get to see them if they played all the games, which none of them do. <laughs> but if they did, they would play at least 82 games where they could possibly be a hero every, like for 82, imagine if you could be a hero 82 times in your life in three months. Right. <laughs> right? And then if they go to the playoffs, now they got another 20, 20 so they got 100 opportunities to be a hero. So if you take a hero and right. you put them in the clothes, that's a whole different thing that right. an, even an actor can't, Sure. You can't, there's no, there's no analog to that for an actor. Yeah, and I'll add to that too. These players are being so strategic right now that they're looking at their, their schedule and when they're playing the Lakers, yeah, the Knicks, yeah. the NBA, the all-star game, the playoff games, the finals, these are all your fashion moments. Yeah. And, right. and, and these are your moments to shine on the court, off the court in real time. So yeah. they, they, we're, we're, sky's the limit. I mean, it's takeover. Well, thank you all. We, we have time for questions. We're about, um, out of time here. Mm -hmm. uh, so if anyone has any questions. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, Oh, my boy Nana, immediately with the hat, I didn't even recognize you, incognito. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I went to break the ice. Um, <laughs> first off, congratulations on this book. It's an incredible art object. I have one, I think it's beautiful. Thank you. And shout out to your editor, because I really can't imagine anyone else writing this book. Mm. Um, and that's because I think the consens consensus in like the writing world is like, you know, Mitch is pretty much the flyest writer. Mm. <laughs> Y'all heard it, I didn't say that. <laughs> I didn't say um, it. If not the flyest, one of the flyest. <laughs> and so, um, but I also know that you're, you're very aware of like yourself in public space as a writer too, mm -hmm. and as an academic. And I think, you know, no one could deny that you are, you know, you have these incredible books, Pulitzer Prize, all these things. And I'm wondering, and I even just seeing you in the spaces, the way you occupy them, I see like the sort of space you're making for us existing a certain kind of way. Mm -hmm. And so um, my question is sort of like, how aware are you of like that space you're sort of making and like yourself as a writer who is accomplished, who is respected, who is an academic, mm -hmm. and can still move through the world as someone who's fresh? <laughs> Uh, and I flat. remember being in an NYU faculty meeting of the writing department, mm. and we, we had to like break into groups, and, and we did some, I don't know, team building thing, and then we had to have people who reported on what the groups were doing. We did it, and, and they were like, okay, Mitch, you be the person. So I, I reported back what we had done in the group. And then one of my fellow English professors came up and said, wow, like, you're so articulate. And I was like, <laughs> like, huh? like, I thought we was professors in here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did, I, did I miss some part of this? Um, and I, and that, it I mean, that's probably 15 years ago, but that stuck with me. And then the other thing I think, like, if you come in not you, it's really hard to maintain a false image. And so I would rather come in and be me and lose opportunities or have someone misapprehend me than to try to be someone else because I couldn't keep it up for, I mean, now I'm in it 20 years. Yeah. So yeah, I appreciate that, man. I appreciate you. Yeah, um, yeah great, great conversation. Oh. I, I loved it. Uh, I have kind of like a two-part question. The first to you, Mitchell, is, is the title of, of the book uh, related to almost like the black exploitation period mm. with Sloopafly. Because mm -hmm. you don't really mm -hmm. hear that word too mm -hmm. much among young people. Mm -hmm. You dress fly, mm -hmm. you know? So that's one question for you. And then for Tammy, um, you know, Seth Curry made a statement that he wanted to promote black businesses mm -hmm. through the runway with black designers. Mm -hmm. So I, I know all the celebrities about money, but do you see any opportunity with this celebrityness to bring economics back mm. to the black community? And, and, you, mm. and you saw kind of like Seth Curry made a move mm. to, to say something about that. So those are my two questions. I mean, I'll take the first one um, since you asked. I mean, fly to me was a very capacious word. You know, it, it, it embodied flying, it embodied 
like actual flying and my, like Michael Jordan and the you know the dunk contest. Um, also the getting fly and then yeah, I mean I watched those films of black exploitation and to me that was empowerment. You know whatever you think about the artistic value of it, it was also expression. And you remember Huggy Bear walking down the street with them big old <laughs> platforms on? Like, that's indelible. And ultimately, what these players are trying to do is make themselves indelible before and after a game. Mm. Yeah. I love it. So yeah, I'll take that one. Um, definitely, I've seen across many other players have, they might not have been so vocal about it, but they're absolutely doing it in their action. They've been supporting black designers, emerging designers specifically. Um, I, I think with the rise of Black Lives Matter and the awareness around it, and at the same time with fashion for protest, it wasn't just about wearing the shirts that blatantly said Black Lives Matter, but it was about just supporting black businesses. I saw a huge shift. I worked with Damian Lillard. He was wearing just black designers that he would find. Um, for sure, Ashea was always looking for emerging designers on Instagram that were minority. Um, so uh, I've seen it across so many players that are just taking social consciousness and taking responsibility for their platform and using this to support the next generation of, of black businesses. Chris 100%. Paul and those HBCU. Absolutely, right. the HBCU uh, initiative yeah. for sure. It's definitely happening and it's growing. All right, thank you. Thank you. Um, how y'all doing? Uh, I wanna say I'm definitely looking forward to purchasing the book and um, seeing what you know the book is all about because the conversation is you know, enlightening. Um, I have a two-part question also. Um, I know we're talking about the runway, I mean, the, the tunnel as kind of like the, you know, the, the place where everybody gets the attention for their dressing. Um, can y'all speak to the NBA draft? Because I feel like the NBA draft is actually <laughs> oh, yeah, we, more, I love that. Um, it, it actually was the first kind of runway. Yeah. And Jalen Rose probably was the first guy to really oh, you like make it pick. a big thing. <laughs> yeah. um, so that's, that's the first part that y'all can answer. And then um, I know we're talking about the NBA, but what do you guys think will be the fusion of fashion with, like, the NIL and high school kids yeah. and all of these things? Because mm -hmm. the game is now global, yeah. even on an amateur level, in addition to the global um, business of, the Euro leagues and things like that. What's the, you know, the emergence of all of that? Let me take this on draft night real yeah. quick. That was a great question about draft night, and we we did not talk about that. So thank you for bringing that up. I mean, we among our circles and and everyone who, you know, knows someone who's been drafted in in recent years. It is the prom night of <laughs> yeah. of the NBA draft night, and and you're right. That is a, a huge fashion opportunity and it's another form of, of the tunnel where all eyes are on the up and coming um, NBA players soon to be drafted. Uh, and then with respect to just the NIL for people who don't name image likeness, um, for people who don't know what NIL means, now um, amateur athletes, in particular amateur basketball players, are able to earn money marketing dollars while they are still amateurs from any number of, of brands. And so that is domestically, the, the, the rules vary from, from state to state for high school players. And of course it will have a, an international effect, but for international players, they are not um, under the same rules for like the NCAA if they choose to go pro internationally. So yes, the um, uh, marketing opportunities are explosive from a much younger age for NBA players, which by the way, um, you look at you know, non-majority black professional sports leagues, uh, like, they're not even league, but professional tennis, yeah. golfers, um, ice skating, they can go pro whenever their talent would demand yeah. it. So it's kind of peculiar that for majority black um, sports, NBA and NFL, that they were not allowed to um, earn money on their name, image, and likeness, even though they oftentimes are, are earning millions and millions of dollars for the universities that they attend, or even the high schools for that matter. Uh, I wanted to ask something about draft night. I mean, that's like one outfit. <laughs> you know, like for me, I gotta see some outfits 
before I'm going to be like, <laughs> you the one. That's true. You know? And you got a lot of people, like, you, you had a lot of time to think. You had your whole life to think about this one outfit. Right, right, And you got right. eight people helping you get dressed. Like, that ain't really the litmus test for me. Like, I need something else from you. That's true. <laughs> Good point. Uh, so, hi, my name is Kelly Pierre. Um, I actually, I'm not, I don't uh, play basketball, but I actually do golf. My company is All Access Golf, and we kind of mix a golf and like urban culture. Mm -hmm. But um, my question is, with the culture of street basketball, what do you think of new platforms like It Is What It Is and the impact that it can make in sports and fashion going forward? Mm. Is it, it, it's called It Is that's, What It Is? That's Cameron and Mace, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I don't know if they're necessarily, I mean, I guess they are, are um, exemplars in a way that you can shift careers, right? Like you can go from being a rapper to, to being a talk show host, essentially, right? They, Stephen A. Smith's. Um, but I don't know if they're like, making necessarily inroads in sports talk. I feel like they're good at what they do, but I don't, I don't know if that's much different than what Stephen A. and Shannon are doing um, over there. But I, I do think, again, for people who are transitioning out of hip hop, if hip hop is 50, the rappers that we know, they old, they're, <laughs> you know, they my age, right? And like, you know, I mean, God bless them, because you can still go do the reunion tour overseas, and you can still, I mean, y'all see how many Hip Hop 50 concerts we had? <laughs> like, everybody ate off of Hip Hop 50. <laughs> but after that, like, you got to be able to sustain yourself. And right. so I think that to have people who were very popular and who are shifting into another career and are doing well at that, I think that's a real beacon in Hip Hop. This will be our last question. I was just curious, um, so I work in fashion. I was just curious if you um, interviewed or featured any wardrobe stylists in your book as well, because Rachel Johnson was really big in um, making, she, mm -hmm. she styles LeBron. She also styles um, Colin Kaepernick. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then Derek Robinson as well, who's really big in, um, those are the two major wardrobe stylists that I know of that mm -hmm. like really put sports at the center front, especially Rachel Johnson, because she really catapulted her career strictly doing sports styling um, and really brought that to the forefront. Because prior to that, I'm not going to lie, like, I'm not really big on streetwear. So like prior to those stylists bringing it to the fashion forefront, mm. people in fashion didn't care. Mm. <laughs> so I was curious if your book highlighted those individuals as well. Um, yes, uh, we have Kalila Beavers in there. I don't know if she's in the room, but she's Mellow stylist. Um, still styling Mellow. He's not, you know, he's a retired player now, and, and you know, Mellow's one of the most, we haven't mentioned him, but I, I would say he's one of the most stylish players in the league, yeah. or former He's gone players. through a few eras. I mean, yeah, he went gone, that yeah. AI era He definitely into... was in that AI big T-shirt, hat turned backward era, and now he's sweating. He went to hoodie Mellow. You know, and, and, and versatile, you know, versatile guy. Yeah, yeah. So yes, we we do hi highlight them, um, and also not just them, but jewelers. Yeah. You know, so I mean, it, it's it is an industry, right? I think that's another thing we didn't talk about is like how much of a cottage industry exists right. around NBA fashion. Um, so yes, sure. they are highlighted. And and I'll, I spoke to Rachel today, so she's the she's the queen. <laughs> <laughs> she did a lot. So yeah. before we close out, if you could give us in the audience, as well as those who might be watching online, just a sense of what they can get from this book. How is oh. it laid out? Yeah. Give us a whole bit. Um, the book is laid out into six eras. Um, each of them, I think, is, I hope, is, is a political or cultural or social moment that is defining what the fashion was in that era. And then interspersed are lists of like top 10 sneakers, top 10 hairdos, top 10 accoutrements. And then inside of that is um, interviews with people who, the you know, Iceman, I know everybody knows Jacob the Jeweler on this side, but the Iceman really had it popping in the league uh, with the custom jewelry. Um, so he's another person that is interviewed in the book. So try to get like as much, many different vantage points of this uh, phenomenon as we could. Thank you so much, Mitch, for always saying yes to the Sean Burke Center. Yeah, <laughs> thank you thank for you. producing this particular book. I'm sure it'll be inspiring for maybe those who will find themselves at their draft 
first yeah. prom night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they will create um, multiple looks yes. so they can. We so need three looks Michigan. from you. Yeah. 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 Thank you so much, Crystal. Thank you so much, Tammy, for giving us such good context and background. Like I said, this book is available in our Schomburg shop. There will be a signing outside in the Langston Hughes lobby. So please do not come up to the uh, stage <laughs> to talk, but you can talk more outside in the lobby. Thank you all for being such an attentive audience. Thank you. You can also find us on social media. I would love to hear what some of you all's favorite NBA players in their style. Thank you so much. We hope to see you next week.